Good evening from our headquarter in Kyiv. This is the Sunday show at Hromatsky International, the only prime time TV discussion program in English explaining Eastern European geopolitical storm. And I'm Natalia Humanyuk. And this week we are discussing the fallout from the week's political drama as one of the big stories also interested uh, outside of Ukraine is the fact that Ukraine uh, withdraw from Eurovision due to the controversy as the winner of the contest Maruv, uh, the winner of the national uh, competition. Uh, cancelled her participation uh, due to the different kind of the discussion with the state with the uh, public broadcaster also uh, claiming her right to be apolitical that's just one part of the story we'll discuss uh, during our panel and the second part of the program would be devoted to the corruption scandal as the deputy secretary of the national security council family uh, is accused of the large-scale embezzlement in defense in particularly smuggling military equipment from Russia and Oleh Gladkovsky uh, is the friend of the President Poroshenko. Of course, the controversy is also there because just one month prior to the presidential election. So we'll follow the story with the authors of the investigation and the panel here. And now I can introduce uh, the uh, team and the people who would, who, with whom we discuss the Eurovision. Um, that's Oksana Skibinska, who is the head of the Ukrainian delegation of Eurovision. Mm -hmm. Sasha Kaltsova, a board member of the public broadcasting company of Ukraine in charge of culture in particular, and Sebastian Gobert, French independent journalist, co-founder of Daleko Bliska Collective, and also for a while uh, Seb had been a reporter here, and uh, uh, Sergei Kane is a music journalist, co-founder of Coma, so all kind of different people, uh, but probably uh, the first question uh, to one of you. Um, <coughs> internationally, um, we're following what Public, uh, public rights that, you know, Ukraine, the, uh, this show, we're not just introducing the topic, we, uh, we assume that our audience know that the winner of the national competition, uh, Maruv, uh, had been, um, there was a controversy that he's, she has been uh, doing gigs in Russia prior to the competition, that was not in the rule of the competition, uh, that it was forbidden. Um, yet, uh, after she had won, got the majority votes, uh, there were new conditions in her contract and she cancelled. Uh, after that, there were also the case of when uh, at least three uh, teams, uh, other teams uh, in the competition denied to go to Israel, where the final will take place. Um, and um, that, by, by the artist herself, um, kind of claimed that there was a political push on her, that she, uh, that, that in the apolitical show, she should demonstrate the position. Uh, whether, and um, what would say on that, that in the end, Ukraine kind of looks not really, let's say, that plural and open um, as the country claims? Well, uh, when we met with the roof, we had a negotiations about the role of uh, winner of the Eurovision. And I would like to tell that uh, when you t took part in uh, something like that, and uh, you know that uh, we weren't a company that uh, provide the uh, Eurovision uh, contest because we don't have any money. So the national, um, the national selection, selection uh, was provided by the other commercial channel, this STB. And uh, because we are uh, not, uh, we, we don't have any finance for this. And for the third year, uh, we don't uh, produce this show. We just uh, see the f finalist and we decide to sign the agreement with uh, he or she or not. And uh, what we got this year, uh, the previous years we had no problems at all uh, because uh, uh, STB uh, had money to send uh, a participant uh, to the finals and this year they have no finance for this and we put some, po some uh, points from the agreement into the other agreement. And it was quite typical because it's from European Broadcasting. Union. Broadcasting Union. It, it was just typical about the rights, about uh, you have to go to conferences, you have to take part in some social life you, around Eurovision. One more, it was about um, you have to agree uh, any improvisation with the uh, EBU also. And uh, our participant this year was like, 
what it is. Uh, I have no freedom and uh, it's uh, quite controversial with my style and I have to tell what I really think. This is my freedom and uh, I won't have any... Um, I won't take any other options because uh, this is me. I want to tell like I think. And uh, we didn't ha didn't try to make any soft power what we're blamed now to, you know. You don't have to do this, you don't have to do this. We, can, we could do a message box, really, for Eurovision. We could do this. But when we start talking, it like was inappropriate for her because she really has her own mind what is going on in country. And we decided it was risky for her as an artist because she, she doesn't want to have anything with the politics, actually. She says it's dirty, I don't like this, I don't want to tell about this. And we supposed both sides that it was risky. What could you tell about? We, we, we were in negotiations together, so. Before, like, uh, Sam, how does it, uh, Sebastian, how does it look from outside? Because, uh, like, uh, we, we re read quite a negative uh, comment on on what is happening, at least in the, you know, in those people who are interested in the Western press. Yeah, well, I mean, obviously, you know, the Eurovision contest in uh, most countries of Europe uh, is seen as an artistic contest, apolitical. So anything that connects to um, a form of, you know, political pressure or campaign to, um, I don't know, to, to, to impose some kind, of, uh, some kind of behavior on an artist and so on, is uh, ill-perceived. Ill uh, so that's, that's the reason, I think, uh, where this, uh, this negative coverage came from. But then we also have to remember that Eurovision is a political contest for many countries, like the Balkans, just to uh, just to name them, uh, but also uh, in the Ukrainian in the, the Ukrainian context, uh, the Eurovision has been very very political over the past few years. The, let's remember that in 2016 it was Jamala who won, and it was a very high moment, a very important moment for Ukraine to remind the world that Crimea has been annexed illegally by Russia. So this is uh, this is also something that is explained and explainable in the in the Ukrainian context. So of course, you know, there is this uh, controversy, there is this uh, this kind of discrepancy of understanding between uh, between what is happening here and what happens in the, and how it's perceived in the, in other parts of the of the continent. But I think it's uh, it's it's something it's something very very simple to explain. Did you have, um, what is the discussion with the uh, organizers of the competitions? Are there any chances of fine? Because in the end still, like, um, a lot of people like uh, what uh, the position of Jamala, you know, so we would favor her political stance. Now a political stance we won't favor and it looks dubious. So like, don't the people who are apolitical, uh, don't they have right to remain like that? Uh, speaking about the relationship uh, with the European Broadcasting Union, they are the owner of the contest. So, of course, as soon as this decision was made, uh, we communicated this decision to them. So we informed them, them that Ukraine intends to withdraw from active participation, but not from participation in full. This means that we still want to broadcast the shows, uh, we still want to promote the shows in Ukraine, uh, but uh, avoid the active participation, which means that we need to present a rep uh, an artist. Yeah, a contestant in the show. Uh, so now we um, keep uh, this negotiation with the EBU uh, regarding uh, how uh, UAPBC is going to broadcast the shows, how it's going to promote the shows. Uh, the EBU have already made their official statement uh, because uh, there were a lot of different questions to them. Uh, so they expressed their opinion that uh, they uh, would not intrude into this situation with the national selection because the national selection is always the response responsibility of each particular broadcaster. So as soon as um, the national selection is over and uh, the country presents a representative, then it's uh, the international event. Uh, before that, it's a national selection and they do not uh, uh, 
it's not their part of uh, responsibility, it's UAPBC's part of responsibility. So their official statement was that uh, uh, UAPBC has the right to uh, decide whether or not to participate in the contest. Mm -hmm. well, one more thing that so we wanted to avoid an, uh, this political thing after we actually had some problems uh, with the Yulia Samoilova when uh, our government didn't uh, let her enter the country. We have it was to a pay. Russian um, yeah. musician. Contest, yeah. it was a Russian musician and we have to pay in the fine and this time we wanted to avoid politicization as far as we can and we couldn't do this because it, when the show started and it, it, it took place in the other channel it was politicized already. Mm -hmm. Other bands who were participating, like the Freedom Jazz, Casca, uh, they uh, decided they, they won't go, they were approached. Uh, another band, Brunet Should Blunts, uh, which uh, some people internationally know, uh, anyway said that even if we would be approached, we won't go, which looked like a bit of solidarity uh, among the artists that uh, we don't stand uh, by this kind of either pressure or wherever you, you, you name. Sergey, what's your uh, point on that? Uh, of course, Eurovision is the, you know, maybe pop competition, you know, mm -hmm. we can speak whether the quality music is there. However, still, um, how would you describe the, the right of the artists, you know, or like this demand of the artists to have a clear political position? Well, that's a good question. Um, I think we can demand from others only basic things, like don't kill someone or don't steal someone. And things like active political position must be a choice of, a personal choice of everyone. And if you're an artist, it doesn't um, necessarily um, takes your political position with it. Your art can be, can exist in some other form that can be a political commentary, not, not, but not a straightforward one. So uh, speaking of the um, solidarity that you mentioned between the artists, I don't think it was uh, solidarity with Maruf. I think it was uh, about their own personal reasons and interests. Because, for example, I don't think that Brunet should Blondes really wanted to go there. I, sh I think they wanted to just uh, show themselves on TV. So that's not the thing. I think uh, the there other... is a bit of irony. People who participated somehow wants to go. <laughs> well, the other thing okay. is, uh, are artists really the one, the ones to blame for the for the whole international situations? Because artists are an easy target, but what do we actually do for them to speak more freely, to uh, be less afraid of the consequences of what they're talking about? Because um, even if they will say clearly their position, they, the position might not be respected in the country because we are not, still not ready to listen all the sides of it. So when you are asked the question and you can't answer it, it's bad. And no matter if you're an artist or just, uh, just a human being. Mm. And if you're uh, afraid of saying what you think, is bad and you're a bad artist and if you're afraid of saying what you think because that's what art is you have to express yourself right so it's a it's, it's a mixed situation and on the one hand we don't um, have the right to demand something from artists but at the same time if the art if the artist can't articulate his position at all then maybe it's not a good artist so it, it seems it's a mixed to me, thing. It seems to me that this, this debate has been going on for many, many years, and I mean, f even for centuries, but in the Ukrainian context in something like five years. Uh, but the artist and the art is de facto a component of the hybrid war between R Ukraine and Russia. And we see that many artists have been asked to make uh, political statements. Some of them like do it by themselves. Uh, Ukrainian authorities have denied entry on, to the to the Ukrainian territory to many Russian uh, to many Russian artists. So this is something that has been going on, and I believe that it's going to go on for quite uh, for quite a while. So the situation that we have that we had in 2017 with the Russian contestant, and that we have now, I believe that we can have have it again in the future. What really struck me in this case is that. It seems to me that there has been a consensus for five years to use art, media, 
um, literature, all kind of um, all kind of art artistic expression um, to defend the Ukrainian cause, to defend the idea of uh, of territorial integrity, and to face off this uh, this Russian aggression. And it seems to me that it was very pregnant. It was very prevalent when Jamala won, for example. It was she was supported by an overall uh, majority of uh, of Ukrainians. But like the fact that this Eurovision case this year uh, provokes such a controversy, it seems to me that the consensus is kind of falling apart. And we see the way that a candidate as popular as Zelensky has used the, this, uh, this case saying, come on, like, let the poor girl like, perform in Russia. Like, why do we allow uh, smuggling and, and so on, so on, so on, but not this girl like, uh, uh, performing in Russia. And in this kind of statement, he's supported by quite a large number of Ukrainians. So the issue has become very divisive. I probably need, um, would clarify for our international audience that in the end the contract had been signed with Maruv um, not uh, because of her concert, concert in Russia but because of the legal rights for her song who, uh, which belonged to the uh, Warner Brothers Russia. But still um, the question for both of you in the end, the public broadcaster, which is going under reforms, which had been, you know, fighting for this position of the independent media, of the media which kind of try to show different positions of view, doesn't look good for anybody. In the beginning, that it was possible that somebody who played in Russia could dare to be on the stage, and later that there was this kind of political demand, and in the end there was no this position that, you know, we'll give the platform for anybody disregarding the views, because that's all about the plurality. What do you would answer in that? That it, it really doesn't look good for the country and for the company, for the company which is trying to build an independent media in Ukraine, uh, where people should come with different opinions. Actually, I think, uh that public media in every country, this is a place for talking about hard things. And if we don't have any agreement in society that you cannot go or you can go, because uh, there are 50-50 situations, absolutely. If we cannot uh, make an agreement like a society that we don't blame these people. Okay, we, if we see gambling, we see artists. Artists is not, not, not this, this evil as a gambling <coughs> with Russia. Uh, we have to decide as a society, uh, do we blame artists? It's not about Maruf, actually, because she was ready to cancel some... Uh, we thought that she would deny on this uh, uh, line. line, but uh, she agreed and she made some calls and it wasn't easy for her. And she denied to go to the uh, Most TV Prize that took place yesterday. And uh, we uh, saw a, uh, a person who would like to represent the country. Why don't we look good, actually? I think, and I was uh, talking to our colleagues from other uh, countries, with the public media, the public companies, they told us that you have to make an, a national discussion about this. And you are the media that, it's not about decision, you, your decision is to make a public discussion on uh, short objects, if we can say this. Is this discussion there? Do we see it? I mean, I, and what's your all that? Because, you know, we have the fight on Facebook by some of kind of rather extreme yeah. positions. Uh, but uh, I don't really see the, the, the proper discussion, you know, about the freedoms and... We are starting in, uh, on radio this week and next week. We, uh, we uh, would like to make some uh, research because we have to understand do people in Russia that come to Ukrainian uh, gigs, do they feel something other? Uh, after the gig, because when we are talking to Maruf, and she is very, you know, uh, artistic person, and when we were asking her, do you really believe uh, when it was a part of the non-official uh, uh, conversation. conversation, and do you really believe that people, uh, after your gigs, after seeing a beautiful Ukrainian artist, would stop aggression against us? And she says that, yes, I believe in, in the power of music. 
But you know, it's a, so upright, a, a highbrow position like this. Yeah, you know, it, you have to be enlightened a lot to believe in such a thing. And yes, I agree that uh, we don't have a national agreement on this, so we don't have a, green, a national decision. And I really think that it's good that we don't send anyone before we agreed, like as a society, that okay, artists can go to Russia. I'm not a head of the company, and I have to protect uh, BBC also before the election. But you know, we were attacked for several times before election, and I really believe that if uh, our company decided to let her go, we would be attacked much more, and nobody is telling about this. But I think uh, it's a good decision not to set anybody because we don't have a national consensus. Still, you asked other. Are the, are the participants to go and you only taken the decision? Only two of them. And I think they were afraid of uh, Marov post on Facebook and they didn't actually see the, the agreement itself. So it was a surprise for us that uh, guys thought, okay, we, are, we, we don't want to. And uh, Sergei, maybe you would, uh, how do you think this, uh, the whole situation would impact on the um, artistic freedoms in Ukraine? Talking to the artists, you know, not every single artist is ready to be Ukrainian ambassador and feels that's his or her job. Like, uh, and because we see now that there are a lot of kind of younger artists, you know, some demonstrate very open position like independent Ukraine, no Russian troops in Crimea. Some others are highly popular, but they don't want to talk to journalists at all in order not to be asked this question, because it doesn't matter what they would be asked. Somebody won't like it. And it speaks something about the freedom, uh, generally about the freedom of expression in Ukraine. So what exactly is the question? So, so really, how do you know, you, you're speaking with the artists. Um, how do you really feel this particular event can't, uh, uh, influence the uh, the freedoms of the artists here, the way they express themselves? Well, there is no freedom of artistic self-expression in Ukraine for a few years already, for understandable reasons. And it's just a period. Well, for now, it's harder to express yourself, because everyone is too heated up with the situation. So. Yeah, I would agree that there is a problem with artistic self-expression in general, but the reasons for the, that problem are, well, understandable, explainable, and, well, I don't see any other ways it could happen with artistic freedom when you have war in your country. And um... you, you, you have to deal with anger of people if you want to say controversial things uh, in country with war. But do you believe that the election could change the situation? Um, they might make it worse, I would say. Yeah. I don't see any option how it can make the situation better. Um, well, not for now. Mm -hmm. Oksana, you're talking to the uh, people from the EBU, the organizers of the competition. Do they have this understanding? And uh, what also the, the, the answer? I understand about, we understand all about the rights, but generally, um, you know, Ukraine had been, uh, a couple of years ago, Ukraine had won Eurovision, and mm -hmm. it's still not a normal situation. <laughs> Uh, of course, we are talking to them. It's just the beginning of the negotiation. Uh, we've just announced this decision and now it's a process. It's a process of negotiation and discussion. Uh, what we understand is that they support our idea that the risks of uh, making it too political, uh, they were high. And we did everything possible to avoid those risks uh, come true. So that was the aim, given the situation. They follow the situation, they see how it was around the national selection, uh, how high the risks were, and uh, they know that we did everything possible to avoid that these risks come, go from national to international level. We are, we cannot do, we cannot do this, allow this happen because this is prohibited by the rules of the Eurovision Song Contest. It's a non-political event, and it's the task of us as the broadcaster that is part of the EBU and uh, a broadcaster that participates uh, actively or passively in the Eurovision Song Contest to not to let this happen. Just a short question. If there was a chance to do it differently, what would you do differently? I won't tell. <laughs> <laughs>
Okay, okay, let's see, and let's see how it would um, dwell, but I uh, thanks a lot for, for talking and probably explaining to the international audience what is the discussion in Ukraine, because like, we are as well, like tweeting, writing on Facebook, everywhere, um, reading a lot of comments that there is a lot of misunderstanding, and, uh, and it's true, there is a discussion in Ukrainian society, both regarding the Maruv, both regarding the role of the uh, public broadcaster. Thanks a lot for this panel and we'll go on. And I'll now introduce another topic, uh, so we'll be back in a minute. What I should say that we are in the second part of the program, we will look at the uh, uh, the huge corruption scandal because the son of Oleg Gladkovsky, Deputy Secretary of Ukraine's National Security and Defense Council, uh, had been accused in involvement of the large-scale embezzlement scheme that involved smuggling Russian military equipment into Ukraine. Uh, that was uh, the investigation of the team Nashi Hroshi uh, from Bihus.info. Uh, what is interesting that Oleg Gladkovsky is a close friend of Ukrainian President Petro Poroshenko and uh, the claims also say that Igor Gladkovsky procured Russian military equipment, which was then purchased by Ukraine's state defense um, organization Ukrabronprom at the several times market race with the consent of the company's management. Now you can see the guy on our video. And uh, the journalist also assert that Igor Gladkovsky turned to his father for help at highest levels while the dirty work uh, was done by his partners. Uh, also on the February 26th, President Petro Poroshenko voiced support for the removal of Oleg Gladkovsky from the office. Still, uh, the, uh, the, the story is unfolding. And uh, before we start um, the discussion and also talking to the author of the investigation, I suggest we, uh, sh we watch a short fragment. Як бачите, сувора реальність значно відрізнялася від папосних заяв чиновників. Суцільне імпортозаміщення було лише в телевізорі, а в реальності повноводна ріка контрабанди. Але проблема насправді була не в самій контрабанді, адже деталі потрібні були тут і зараз. І давайте чесно, дістати їх, окрім як звідти, було ніяк. Проблема була навіть не в брехні чиновників, що чорного ринку не існує. Головна проблема була в тому, Тому, що цей чорний, але усе ж ринок, осідлали окремі свої посередники, які накручували ціни в рази. А державний концерн «Укроборонпром» залюбки переплачував, бо концерн був не жертвою схематозу, а його учасником. І саме про це наше розслідування. Плохо. Директорам державних заводів мало ставати вже від самого прізвища Ігоря – Гладковський. Син Олега Гладковського. Обидва – Гладковський і старший, і молодший – по життю були далекими від оборонної теми. Доки у лютому 2015 року легка рука Порошенка не призначила свого партнера – Гладковського тата, першим замсекретаря РНБО. І син автоматично отримав вплив у цій же сфері. Просто завдяки прізвищу. Лютий 17-го. Жуков переконує Павла Букіна, що йому вдалося налагодити канали контрабанди з Росії запчастин до танків Т-80. Павло Букін на той час – директор одного з підприємств концерну. По Т-80 з поставщиками з Росії зустрічались. Списки видали. Люди перевірені. Русські чи наші? Русські. А завозити хто буде? Контрабанди, як і звичайно. Хто завозить? Не будь дилетантом. Хто їм везе? Завожу с Белгорода я, своим перевозчиком. Виталик, завозят два человека всего на сегодня. Обоих знаю. Ты сам не везешь, не обманывай. Географія закупівель була зав'язана в основному на Росію. Фігурують Москва, Пітер, Челябинськ, Білгород. Фізично організацією поставок займався в основному Рогоза, як молодший партнер. Він їздив на кордон, він спілкувався з контрабандистами та іншими постачальниками, у яких перекуповували товар тут, на внутрішньому базарі. Листопад 16-го року. Рогоза замовляє деталі у одного з постачальників. Фрейрок, як ти мені дорог? Мне сейчас срочно нужно БТР-80, рычаг нижний 190 штук, рычаг верхний и задний 77 штук. Срочно! Хм, прикольно. Ты заканчивай с запоями, мы не хотим тебя терять. Помогай, пожалуйста, горит. Одна з ключових проблем із контрабандними вживаними деталями – це їхня якість, яку хлопчики перевіряти не напружувалися. Просто перли на заводи все підряд. Іноді фактично металобрухт. 
осінь 15-го року. Зі службової записки вхідного контролю Київського бронетанкового заводу. Важелі не на той БТР, підігнати неможливо. Редуктори – теж половина лівих. Як підганяти – неясно, їх навіть на випробувальний стенд поставити неможливо. Мости – теж не на той БТР, підігнати можна, але важко. На всіх непрацездатний диференціал. Запчастини, хоч контрабандні, хоч армійські, були нелегальні. Щоб продати їх державному концерну, деталі потрібно було відбілити, приховати їхнє походження. А отримання від концерну гроші перевести у готівку. Обидві проблеми вирішували через конвертаційні центри. Вони відмивали одночасно і деталі, і гроші. Роботу з ними організовував Жуков. Одноденки створювали, щоб вони фіктивно на папері продавали деталі, яких офіційно ні в кого не купували – оптимі. Ця фірма, як ми вже говорили, була центральною в бізнесі хлопчиків. А вже оптима продавала запчастини концерну. Іноді для посередництва використовували інші компанії. Тривалий час такою прокладкою був навіть президентський завод – Ленінська кузня. Гроші від державних заводів йшли у зворотньому напрямку, доходили до фіктивних компаній, і переганялися у готівку. So, uh, the whole scheme you've just seen, uh, they, the scheme netted at least 250 million hryvna. Uh, it's uh, around 9 million US dollars, uh, which was laundered through various methods. That is the allegation of these uh, investigations. And to uh, discuss that, we have with us, besides Sebastian Gobert, who stays with us to discuss the issue while following it, uh, we have Alada Roslitsky, who is research and advocacy manager, Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Committee. So, Lara, um, you particularly look into the fence. What do we make out of this case? How significant is that? Well, I think that this case is um, just exemplary of the level of corruption that we are dealing with in Ukraine. But corruption in the defense industry globally runs at a cost of about 20, million, 20 billion dollars loss annually. So this is just a drop in the but, uh, bucket, globally speaking, but a very serious problem for Ukraine. Uh, Sebastian, of course, I think like a lot of foreign reporters were writing myself saying like, oh, how would it influence uh, President Poroshenko uh, polls? Uh, there are elections coming soon. Uh, of course, we are not guessing here, but how you are researching and looking at the environment, that's probably what is interested for our audience. Yeah, I mean, obviously the fact that this report, this investigation comes out just one month before the election, you know, raises the eyebrows, like why now? Especially because we're dealing with, uh, with talking about facts that are kind of old, at least like two years old for some of them. Uh, how is it going to affect uh, Poroshenko's chances, ch chances in, the, in the election? I'm not really sure, it's kind of unclear because this, um, this allegation of corruption at the highest level of the state has been quite important has been quite prevalent for quite a long time and especially in the defense industry where uh, we know that something like 80 percent of the tenders have been kept secret for uh, for the past few years we also remember some scandals uh, this uh, story with the backpacks that were uh, ordered by the i mean it, it was a case of embezzlement that involved the, the son of the minister of interior arsena vakov and so this idea that there is corruption in the defense industry and that this is happening in a country at war and that this is extremely um, detrimental to the soldiers and to the defense of the, of, the national, uh, of, of the national integrity has been important for a long time. So it's hard to tell how it's going to affect the ongoing campaign. Before we talk to Lesia, the author of the investigation, my question to you, Lada. So really, where are we looking at when we are l investigating the corruption in the Ukraine? It's something very general. Corruption in defense. Mm -hmm. It's something very general. But where people should look at and where are you looking at as your organization? Well, uh, NACO, the Independent Anti-Corruption Committee in Defense in Ukraine, is looking at more the systematic institutional corruption risks that exist so that we can identify them, work with civil society, democratic control oversight bodies, as well as MPs, uh, to change them, to identify them and support reform that has been made an obligation as far as your Atlantic integration. That having been said, I would like to comment on the fact that, the, that journalists at this date, 2019, 
have been able to investigate and inform the Ukrainian uh, population and the international community of something as serious as this is a huge uh, progress for Ukraine. I'm not sure if 10 years ago we would have such a strong civil society and uh, journalist groups to do so. So this is also a positive uh, aspect that we could consider. Um, we'll yeah, look I, actually, just to, as a follow-up, they have also informed the Ukrainian authorities themselves. <laughs> they, have, they have forced the general prosecutor to react on this uh, on this issue. And I should say the general prosecutor says that the investigation was already there. Exactly. That was the mm -hmm. his, uh, the general prosecutor of Ukraine, Yuri Lutsenko, as well as the, the, that Ukrabyronprom blasted the claims as manipulated. We have with us Lesia Ivanova, who is the author of this investigation, it will still follow. There would be two more series. Um, Lesia, what would you say on uh, the reaction of your investigation? Uh, you know, the, the um, Oleg Gladkovsky was on other TV channels saying that it's all manipulation. Uh, and um, how do you see also the reaction of the authorities? Hi, Natalie. Hi, everyone. Um, to start with, basically, this is a minimal, minimum reaction that they could do just to keep their faces. Uh, because uh, none of them has started any active, um, act active uh, stuff to do. Uh, at least I do not see it. Uh, what comes to uh, Prosecutor General, what he said about the law enforcement organs being on the finish line of their investigations sounds pretty much like a um, lame joke, if not to say a lie. Because here in Ukraine, we have an uh, open register for um, court decisions. This is where we get information also. It's an open source. And what I see from this open source is that um, all the um, like police, anti-corruption bureau, prosecutor office, everyone have started uh, the criminal proceedings. They opened the criminal cases against these guys, but um, no one still have put charges. Uh, all the cases, all the criminal proceedings are either closed or dead, basically. Not closed officially, but physically dead. So when he said that they've been on a finish line, this really sounds like a lie, because what I see from the court uh, court register is that not a single, um, not a single law enforcement uh, office did move as high as Glotkovsky. Uh, Glotkovsky, last name, his name does not really sound in this investigations, which means that either they did not move as high as his uh, name, or they decided to close their eyes and not to see it. So if they are on a finish line, then why a week has passed since we've published it? And I, I do not see uh, any law enforcement organ, none of them, uh, putting their uh, leg over the porch of these guys with searches or arrests or charges. Alyssa, your investigation is based on the leak, uh, in particularly on the uh, conversation, telephone conversation uh, and messenger conversation between two young guys who are, well, one of them is the son of the deputy, um, head of the uh, dep deputy secretary of the National Security Council. Um, yet how you can, you know, prove the, uh, th that they are genuine, because of course uh, there was a lot of information that, you know, it's manipulation. Um, so how you manage to be sure that it's exactly uh, these people and uh, so please your answer okay. the first thing that has to be um, that I have to state uh, and everyone has to understand is that um, this leak what we got from it the messages the emails and stuff this is not something the investigation is based on it is something that we used to illustrate the investigation because um, from the very beginning we started to work on this topic two years ago and it was based actually on those uh, criminal cases buried by uh, dumped by uh, prosecutor office and and the others uh, so we started it with uh, uh, when we saw in the uh, court register that there are a lot of cases, but they are all dead. 
and it was really strange. Uh, we started investigating it. We got a lot of documents, officially, unofficially. We've spoken to dozens of people, of course, also officially and unofficially. Uh, so we've been working on it for two years, and like um, a year and a half from the date that we started. Um, well, for, first of all, we've published the first part of it two years ago. So we've started two years ago, and the first time that we've published this story, like half of it, part of it, what we did, uh, what we managed to do uh, that time, it was autumn 2017. So it, it, it just didn't start uh, half a year ago. Half a year ago, when we received this leak, um, there, was what, there was not much in it that surprised me, because we already knew that, and we had a lot of uh, proofs. Uh, with official documents, well, of course, we got it officially or unofficial. This is our uh, other sources, but um, everything that was stated in it, like the state contracts from the state military plans, we did have it already. Uh, everything that concerned the uh, money laundering and uh, cashing it out from uh, f uh, through the uh, fictitious companies. We did have it like for long ago. We also had a lot of uh, evidences from the uh, different um, security cameras from different uh, military plants. And of course, we had a lot of evidences from the people who uh, were willing to share, but were not willing to speak on camera, but we did trust them. So basically, uh, when we got this leak, uh, what was new in it is mostly um, emotional part of it. So what did what did concern the uh, facts? We already had it, and so it was quite easy to prove it. It took a lot of time actually to lead uh, to read everything, uh, to 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 analyze it, to manage it into three parts of investigation, to do the shootings, to do the video editing and stuff. It really uh, took like half a year. Uh, so this is why it's it's been published only now. Uh, should it be easy to to do it quicker? We could have published it like before. But what concerns uh, what goes up with uh, proving it? Uh, every single thing that we claim in this investigation and illustrate with these messages is proved by other sources and mostly documentary sources. But as far as this is a TV product, yes, and it, it has to be digestible for people, we used a lot of these um, messages just to show it uh, from the more human like, point of view. Alessia, thanks a lot, and I'll uh, thanks a lot for your work and for talking to us. I also would say that within the next two weeks, uh, there would be two more series. So please follow both our colleagues in Ukraine and Bihus.info, and as well, Hromask International would follow up the story. Uh, there would be some details. Uh, but Lada, my question to you is: this story more or less is saying and explaining how. Two quite a young guys. One is a son of uh, the high official, a friend of the president. Uh, they were the friend of the president. Uh, were kind of forcing the big guys, the head of the uh, huge industries, uh, the big plants all over the country, to do what they wanted, uh, to be involved in this smuggling scheme. Um, so, uh, looking at the Ukrainian defense sector. Sector, where do you see these weak gaps of such organization as Ukrobron Prom? Because it's really mm -hmm. huge. That's a really good question because we target Ukrobron Prom in it, and this is an institution that was created um, argu arguably un illegally under an illegal uh, um, decree by the president, Yanuko, former president of Ukraine, Yanukovych. And we're at this stage. Right now, looking at Ukrobron Prom, its role in Ukraine, its future role, and how it could be changed. Whether that entails a corporatization, whether that entails a dissolution, or a creation of a new uh, administra administrative body inside of the Ukrainian government that would take care of a state defense um, order in the industry in itself. Uh, we're working on the audit, so there is a little bit of news moving forward. The, pro the process is quite slow, unfortunately. But for the first time since it's been invented, Ukrobron Prom has uh, agreed to submit itself to three international audits. 
and we are waiting any uh, actually expecting some news on the next steps forward uh, in the coming weeks we've already had 12 internationally recognized um, audit firms who have a, who have a, a submitted bids and we're looking forward to seeing how things develop in this regard uh, Sebastian, within the last years, you've been covering a lot of events in Ukraine, including the corruption scandal. What's make this different? Or is it just one of many? It's one of many. It, it just comes one month, be, uh, one month before uh, the presidential election. That makes it very, very special. Uh, but, I mean, we cannot, <coughs> uh, we cannot say that the journalists did it on purpose or anything like that. I mean, mm -hmm. the, the, our, our colleague explained, explained why it took so long. Also, we have to say that just a few days after the scandal came out, the virus.info published another investigation on uh, the, um, the, the yeah on the on the on the shady the financing of the Timoshenko campaign. So this is this is something different. But um, when it comes to this scandal, it's important in a country at war. But as I said before, it's only the confirmation. It comes only as the confirmation of something that people really believed before, that there was embezzlement, that there was corruption in the, in, in the, in the, in the industry sector, in the, in the defense sector, sorry. And this is something that we can hear on the front line, that you know, the guys in Kiev actually steal from us. They ask, they ask us to, uh, to pay with our lives for their mistakes and for their corruption and so on and so on. So this comes as a, uh, as a, as a, as a confirmation of a popular belief. We'll see exactly whether this is going to turn into something bigger. Vladimir, well, probably a short um, answer. International community is backing Ukraine, in particularly in military and defense. That's right. what Ukrainian leader, leaders were asking for the last five right. years. Um, how you really see these things uh, influence that? Because it's true that Ukraine had been supported mm -hmm. by, by the Western allies and uh, right. what could be their reaction? Well, I'm sure that all of us can agree that if we were uh, international donors or co countries supply supplying uh, security assistance to Ukraine, this would call for our attention. And perhaps it is a call for the international community to seriously consider the use of more strict conditionality when, when supplying Ukraine with security assistance in order to uh, promote a move away from uh, this corrupt political criminal activity towards actually promoting the reforms which have been formally signed to and agreed to by the current administration and government and the Ukrainian people. Thanks a lot. I should probably also say, I would probably again um, remind that the President Petro Poroshenko voiced support for the removal of Oleg Gladkovsky from the office. However, he's still there. And I encourage our audience to read the article, Pre-election can beat, will Poroshenko sacrifice a friend for presidency? On our webpage, en.hromatsky.ua, as uh, uh, the Oleg Gladkovsky has a very long story of relations with the president. Uh, they were really the close partners for decades. And uh, this article um, would allow you to understand uh, the nuances between their relations in particular. And with that, I say you th thank you. That was Sebastian Gobert, who is a French uh, independent journalist here in Kiev, co-founder of Daleko Blisko Collective. So follow uh, Sebastian's stories. And Lada uh, Roslitsky, who is research and advocacy manager for Independent Defense Anti-Corruption Committee. And uh, I appreciate you watching Romansk International and the Sunday show. We are there 24-7. Uh, we are there on social networks, Facebook and Twitter. Search Romansk International. Sign up for our weekly newsletter. Uh, you can find it, uh, the subscription at en.hromatsky.ua and thanks a lot.